Hello everyone, I hope you all are safe home and watching all our astronomical videos. Today, uh, we are we from Antariksh are there with a one more new and exciting topic for you all. Uh, also, uh, based on this topic, we would have a quiz uh, from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. And if you answer the questions correctly, you could even get an e-certificate on your registered email ID. Uh, we at Antariksh uh, of Vishwakarma Institutes are trying really very hard and coming up for coming up with new and new videos based on astronomy, astrophysics, the technical aspects of astronomy, and that we would be learning more and more. Uh, today we have with us is Dr. Shivraj Khandeshami. Uh, he's uh, currently working at Ayuka as a senior technical officer. Uh, he has done. He has done his graduation from Vivekananda College and his post graduation from IISC. Uh, his current research interest includes uh, data mining, uh, computer programming, uh, statistical math uh, statistical mathematics, and he is currently research uh, working on gravitational waves. As you can see, he is even affiliated to the uh, Michigan University. Um, now, I guess we should uh, listen from him about this talk. So let's begin. Thanks for, okay. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, so I am I am Shivaraj, as, as, as was mentioned. I am a research faculty here in Ayuka. Uh, I have been working on gravitational waves and LIGO for the last 10 years. Uh, so in this talk, I'm going to focus on uh, some of the challenges that involved in building a detector to detect gravitational waves and uh, how that were overcome in LIGO so that we were able to detect gravitational signals. Okay, let's uh, probably start the talk. So this is my first slide. Um, can you go to the slides? Okay. Um, okay. So let's start with uh, uh, before we go into these technical discussions. Let's start with a brief uh, uh, introduction of uh, what is gravitational waves. Um, that basically it starts with general relativity. In general relativity, space and time are interconnected, so they behave as a single object. Uh, in that space time, whenever we put a massive object, it actually affects the space time. Basically, distorts or curves the space time. And when we say gravity is basically the curvature or the distortion of the space time by that massive object. So you see that equation in this page, which relates the curvature produced by a massive object, which is on the right side. So it relates the curvature and, and the mass and the energy. So this is the basic uh, equation uh, in general relativity. And from this, uh, we derive the uh, effects of gravity and also gravitational waves. Um, so here is a pictorial representation of like a two dimensional representation of what happens when a massive object is embedded in the space time. So it basically distorts the space time around it. And the distortion is proportional to the size of the, uh, the mass of the object. As you can see the sun, the sun and the earth and the sun has like a larger mass. And so it, it distorts significantly compared to earth. So this is a static distortion. If the object is not moving, the distortion will be static. But in general, what happens is that these objects move so the distortion will also move along with them. And, uh, and this produces ripples in this that fabric of space time. So this is a video that is showing like two objects um, that, are, that are distorted their local space time, but they are moving around each other. So that distortion is also at the end, it actually um, behaves as a wave uh, from the two objects and propagate from there to the rest of the universe. So these waves, what we call gravitational waves, and want to detect with our detector. So this is a two-dimensional representation of what happens. So whenever the, the, the object moves around, so it actually contracts the space near it. And um, those are those fluctuations are actually moved from there to the rest of the universe. So as I said, uh, these uh, ripples in the space-time are what we call gravitational waves. And uh, 
uh, they expect to propagate at the speed of light. And we can probably use these uh, gravitational signals to study the objects uh, that generally don't emit light. And the, the waveforms that the, these signals uh, carry a lot of information about the uh, source they are originated from. So how do we detect these uh, gravitational wave signals? Um, the basic properties of this gravitational wave signal is that they stretch and shrink space time. So um, that means that whatever the objects embedded in the space time will also get affected. So here is an example, an extreme example of an apple. Uh, when a gravitational wave passes through, the apple is like squeezed and stretched. So its size and its shape changes. This is the basic uh, effect of gravitational waves. And he, on the right side, uh, you have a, a ring of particles and a gravitational wave is passing through the, uh, the plane of this ring. And as the gravitational wave passes through, you can see in one direction it is stretched, the other direction is squeezed, and this, this process like continues uh, alternatively. So this is the effect of gravitational waves. And we want to use this effect to de detect gravitational wave signals. So um, one of the system that we can use for such detection is the interferometer. Um, so here is a picture of a uh, simple interferometer where you have a laser source uh, and a beam splitter and a two end mirror. Um, so the laser source, so the, so the light from this laser source comes to the beam splitter and split into two and goes into the two perpendicular direction to the end mirrors and reflect back from those end mirrors and comes back. And when they come back, they can go into the other directions. And then the other direction, we kept a photo detector and uh, the properties of this interferometer is that when the length, bit, length difference between the two arms is uh, zero, you would see a strong uh, signal at the photo detector. If the length difference is like half a wavelength apart, then you see a no signal at the photo detectors. So it's basically uh, this photo detector senses the length difference between the two arms. Since in the previous slide, uh, we saw that that gravitational wave space in perpendicular direction, this interferometer is an ideal device to uh, detect gravitational wave signal. So here is a, at the bottom of this slide, uh, you can see that uh, um, when a gravitational wave passes through, it uh, stretches and springs. Um, the, um, the interferometer, and uh, because of that, the power and this process continues. So now we know how to detect gravitational wave signal. Now, where is the problem in detecting gravitational wave signal? Signal in strain, uh, which is given in the, by this equation, H equal to delta L over L, where delta L is the, the length fluctuation produced by the gravitational wave over the original length. And even for a gravitational wave signal from very massive objects like black holes or neutron star, this value of H is very, very small, like at the level of 10 to the power minus 21. For example, if I have an interferometer with a length scale of like one kilometer, then this converts into a delta L of 10 to the power minus 18 meter, which is like one thousandth the diameter of a proton, which is very, very small. So to detect gravitational wave signal, not only we have to build an instrument that is of kilometer scale, but the instrument is also should be able to sensitive to uh, 10 to the power minus 18 meter uh, length change. Yes. So, the past paper from Einstein about the gravitation wave came in around the quantity A. All cases is very, very small. So, indirectly, he thought that it is very hard to detect gravitational wave signals uh, on Earth uh, with any instruments. The thought at the time who actually formulated this theory was not confident that we would see these gravitational wave signals. The other point is that these gravitational wave signals can only be felt by free masses. Uh, that means uh, the object that we are using in our interferometer has to be free. Uh, so it's so we cannot just like put them on a on a on a tabletop uh, table and uh, ground. Floor, uh, that we cannot do. Um, so it, we, at least we have to simulate uh, the free nature of uh, this. 
So let's start with the first point. How do we increase to know what decides the length sensitivity of an interferometer? Let's start with a simple uh, interferometer configuration. Um, so in a simple Michaels interferometer, the power, at, as I said, the power at the output port depends on the length difference between the two arms. When the arms lengths are equal, you see a maximum power. Um, when the arm length is uh, like half a wavelength apart, you see zero power. Uh, when we say that when arm lengths are equal, the power at the photo detector is actually uh, the sum of the power in the two arms, which is in general like um, sum equal to the input laser power for the simple configuration. So with this instrument, how much uh, small length difference between the two arms that we can measure? Uh, we can make a quick calculation. Let's say, uh, let's assume that the input power is P in, P in, and this photo detector can, me can measure a minimum uh, amount of power is like P detector. Uh, this Generally, this P detector is determined by a few uh, quantities. One is short noise, a junction noise, and uh, digitization noise in this electronic circuits related to this photo detector. Um, let's say, um, in, in, so we, if you use, if you use this uh, P detector, and I think this should be P and P detector, given by lambda is the wavelength of the light, and P input the power in the, in the input laser, and P detector, the minimum the photo detector can detect. So this is what uh, the minimum length difference we can measure using the power fluctuation we see at the photo detector. So if you use some typical numbers of like P input is one watt and lambda is like one micrometer uh, and uh, P detector is just assume that 100 nanowatt it can measure, uh, then uh, this turns out to be uh, 10 to the length difference of 10 to the power minus 13 meter. As we saw in the previous slide, the gravitational wave even from the strongest source produce the difference at the level of minus 18 meter. So we have to let go of five of magnitude from here uh, to, to, to get to the minus 18 lambda, the input power and the what the minimum power the photo detector can measure, only three quantities that we can play around. Um, so let's say wavelength is very um, hard, so we can change by a factor of few. Um, uh, even with that, we will probably be moving into like a gamma ray region. Uh, so that means we have to build a gamma ray lasers, which is at this point not possible. Uh, so we we can't change much uh, with the laser wavelength. And also similarly, it's hard to change the, the detector, uh, what the minimum amount of power the detector can detect. Even the 100 nanowatt is already is like a, a very, very good number for a, for a reasonable detector. So the only thing now we can change is the, the input laser power. Um, so input power, laser power, the current uh, lasers that are available, uh, we can get uh, like around 200 watt stable laser, but uh, not more than that. So we cannot like just buy a laser with a lot, lot of laser power, but we have to do some kind of manipulation of that laser power to increase the effective laser uh, power in the, uh, in the interferometer. So there are a couple of configurations that people, can, people have been using and we do use in LIGO. Um, what two are, one is like a fabric pro cavities where instead of like a beam splitter and end mirror, you also put another mirror in between. So this forms as like a cavity. So the laser that goes inside, it actually multiplies, it, it bounces back and forth between these two mirrors many times and it accumulates in that arm. Uh, so they effectively, this increases the laser power in the arms. As I mentioned in previously, the, the what decides the sensitivity of this instrument is the laser power in the arms. So in this case, we have, since we have built up uh, sufficiently um, large laser power in the arm, this instrument will have high sensitivity for the length fluctuation. The other one is what we can do is we can put another mirror. The way this mirror act is that, that there is some laser that power that comes back to the laser. So whenever um, the laser from the power from these two arms, when they come back to the beam splitter, they have 50-50 way to like go one towards the photo detector and also towards the laser. So we, by using this mirror, what we can do is that whatever the laser that goes towards the main laser can pump back into the interferometer, these arms. So this way also we can effectively increase the power in the, uh, the arms. Um, so that's, that's, we, that's we can increase the sensitivity of this uh, instrument. So now we, we looked at the first point of how to increase the sensitivity. The next uh, 
point is that uh, we need to create a free mass, that the, the mirror has to be free. Um, so one way to create a free mirror uh, in an um, interferometer here is that uh, we can suspend the mirror. So the properties of the suspension is that um, at very high frequencies from the resonant frequency of the suspension, the object generally behaves as a free. Uh, so here is a video, let me play this video. So here you can see that the bob is at the bottom, it is suspended. So we are moving the top part of the bob, uh, the, this uh, suspended object, even though it is moving uh, very much, the, the object at the bottom is not moving. Uh, so this is a, a passive properties of a suspension. So this, the, we generally get a, like one over F square uh, suspend, um, suppression. So it, is, it also depends on the frequency. If it is very low frequency, you don't see uh, any, any amount of sus sus suspension. But if it is like a very high frequency, then the suppression is like given by the one over F squared uh, term. This is the single stage. So if you want to pr produce, a, um, so the other thing is that at these high frequencies, since this bob is not affected by what is happening at the top, we can think of this up bob as a free object. So that is what we call free. It is effectively free, not like a real free, but effectively it is free at those frequencies from the, the vibration surrounding it. So, um, so in LIGO, what we do is uh, we do uh, use these uh, uh, this this, this, uh, properties of suspension. So instead of just using one, sta one stage where you get one over F square suppression, you can use multiple stages to significantly reduce this, uh, the coupling from the ground motion. Uh, so this is a picture of the LIGO suspension. You can see um, is it, this is also like a graphics uh, representation of the same thing. Uh, the bottom is where the, the bottom part is the mirror forms into parameter and the top parts are basically to suspend that bottom part and, and so there are almost like four uh, stages of suspension here so we get like f to the power eight suppression at uh, high frequencies even though at low frequencies this object moves at high frequencies it, it is not uh, connected to the earth it is almost like free from the earth vibrations that's showing like uh, different stages of the suspension, how much suppression that we get. So for if we compare uh, with uh, at one hertz to 100 hertz, we basically uh, can go from 10 to the power minus one to 10 to the minus four, 15. So 10 to the power 14 orders of like orders of magnitude, 14 orders of magnitude suppression we can get at uh, like 100 hertz. So this is another, uh, um, representation of this uh, same suspension, uh, showing a uh, little more details of like how these uh, different parts of the suspensions are, the objects are connected. So not only we use uh, uh, just uh, these uh, four stages of suspension, we also put these four stages of suspension uh, on, uh, on another um, few levels of suspension. Um, so we are basically effectively increasing the number of stages from four to seven. And here you can see the, the size of the object that, that holds these uh, four stages of suspension and people working around it. So this is another representation of the same system where you have these uh, four uh, stages of suspension of, uh, suspended and uh, another three stages of uh, um, isolation. And the, this whole thing is kept inside a chamber. This is the... Uh, so not only we have this uh, passive uh, uh, suppression from these uh, different stages, we also do an active control of the stages so that the, uh, the uh, test mass, the mirror is not effectively moving. So in this case, what happens is that if the ground moves, it moves the whole structure and the direction to the motion of the ground, such that the mirror doesn't see the motion of the ground. So it's effectively free from the surround. Okay. Um, um, I, yeah, I'm also getting this uh, bad network connection. I'm using the, the our, our uh, campus network. Problem. Is it still uh, uh, not not good? Oh, 
Okay. Um, so, so we are, um, so in the previous slide we saw that okay we have this uh, passive isolation from the properties of the suspension, but we also do active isolation to reduce further the uh, connection between the earth and the mirror. Um, so now um, in the previous slides that before the before the suspension part. Power ever effective power. Uh, so, what here from we can uh, use the free from the acceleration that means they can. different peripheral cavity and uh, power six and cavity enhancement to increase the power in the interferometer. Sorry. I'm sorry with these connections. I, I don't know which one to use again. Okay, hope it doesn't have any other problems. Um, so at this point, we, do, we need to control these uh, mirrors so that um, so you, the mirrors are free, but to have these enhancements from these power recycling and fabric power cavities, the mirrors position have to be fixed with respect to each other. So that means we need to control these mirrors to have in their positions. Uh, so that means there is large number of control loops that has to be running to keep these different mirrors in their positions. Even though in this picture, I'm showing like, a, six mirrors in actual interferometer, the number of mirrors is pretty large. Uh, so this is an actual layout, uh, like this is also a simplified layout, but you can already see that the number of mirrors here is much larger than what we saw in the previous slides. So all these mirror position have to be controlled and the, all of these mirrors are all, almost like suspended. Uh, so that means there are a lot of control signal that you have to look at and uh, use those control signals to control the position of these mirrors. Uh, so for that, we actually use uh, uh, a sophisticated control and uh, data systems. Um, so each of these signals are like time stamped and uh, they are linked to, um, uh, since it's a four kilometer, so their system is, system is distributed on, on a four kilometer uh, size. So we need to get the signal from a different mirrors at different positions in a, in a common set place and uh, do a, some data analysis of the signals and then again send back to the control signal to those mirrors. So these things all are like happen through a centralized uh, systems that, that has a common timing for all the um, signals that collected in various parts of the interferometer 
and there is a, um, just a set of computers that process these signals and uh, may produce the control signals and they are sent through these um, optical fibers to these, those mirrors and they are controlled. So the, all these things run at uh, like 65 kilohertz rate um, so that we can, we can, uh, we can control uh, up to um, frequencies like uh, 32 kilohertz. So, so far we saw that uh, um, how to increase the sensitivity of the instrument using the different configurations like Fabry Pro and power recycling, and also how to set a, um, how to make the mirror free. Um, so here, even, even though we can like um, improve the power uh, through these configurations, the actual laser that we are sending in should also be like good. Uh, so they, so what in, in LIGO, what we use is like, uh, we use uh, like um, uh, India solid state laser uh, that has a power output of like 70 to 180 watt. Right now we are using around 70 watts and we hope that we can increase the power of power to 180 watts. So this 180 watt, the 70 to 180 watt laser power has to be stabilized both in frequency and uh, in amplitude. So that, that requires also like a significant work. So here is some, uh, some schematic that's showing um, how these things are done. Uh, you have this laser, uh, laser crystal that's power is come and it is actually, uh, you basically get like one watt laser and that is like multi, that is amplified through multiple stages and also filtered uh, both in terms of power and in terms of frequency. Uh, and also you have another cavity that basically controls this uh, frequency and power. And after the, all this cleaning, this, the, the laser is sent into the interferometer. And this laser is further than amplified through these uh, fabric uh, cavities and power recycling cavities. So this is a picture that's showing this, uh, the, uh, the previous uh, uh, setup layout. Um, you can see the, the, this, is, this box is the reference cavity. The, the reference cavity has is is, is very um, it, it is it is easily affected by humidity and temperature and that's why you have this uh, uh, covering that so that you isolate from uh, temperature variation and humidity variations. Uh, so all these all these uh, mirrors are basically simulating this uh, different layer different object in this picture. So the, this is the uh, initial stage where they were setting up these uh, laser systems. Um, this is this has to be a clean room, so people has to be careful in working on in this system. So they are fully suited, and also using goggles because these are one watt laser to 35 watt, 70 watt laser, which is already like powerful laser. So you have to be careful. And uh, this is uh, this is a pipe where through which the laser is sent into the interferometer. So this room is isolated from the interferometer. The laser is laser. This you start with like one two watts laser. And it is multiplied, uh, amplified uh, by in multiple stages to produce around 70 watt. Then that is sent into, into the interferometer. Uh, so um, as I saw, so there are like um, to increase, we have to increase the sensitivity of the instrument through um, these different stages of amplifications and also through through these different cavities. Um, but that is once one uh, one step uh, in building this instrument. But we also have to study what are the other nice sources that affect the operation of this instrument. So here is a nice budget that's showing what are the sources that, that affects the operation of the instrument. So what we saw in the previous slide is generally the quantum noise. This is the, the this purple curve, this purple curve. Uh, but there are also other non-technical noises that comes in when you build the instrument. These are basically coming from the environment surrounding the instrument. So they also affect the operation of the instrument. But you can see that it's mostly dominated by this, this quantum noise that we looked at in the previous slide, the, the laser noise in the laser and how much power that you can put in into the interferometer. Um, but the other thing, other, other noise is also affect, but they generally affect at, at low frequencies. So this is one of the nice sources that we looked at in the previous slide, thermal noise. This comes from the, the motion of the small motion of the Brownian motion of the particles on the surface of the mirror. Uh, this can actually significantly affect. And if you look at the, uh, this picture, um, the, the Brownian noise is actually close to the, the interferometer sensitivity around 100 Hertz. So we are basically limited by the, uh, this uh, thermal noise at around 100 Hertz. So one other thing people are doing in the next generation detector is to how reduce this thermal noise so that we can go below that curve. So thermal noise can also come from the suspension. Since as I said, we need to have this uh, object suspended. 
But the problem is that when you have suspended objects and you are connecting your two different metal materials at the, at the point of connection, you can have like some thermal noise. So to avoid that, uh, the, uh, the suspension, suspended wi the wires for the suspension in LIGO are made up of also glass, the same material as the, as the mirror, so that you don't have like two different materials to avoid uh, the, the, these dust particles contaminating the system. And also, if you have a, a air inside a, a, in, a, in, a, in an interferometer arm, what happens is that these air fluctuations, the air densities can change, and that can produce a, a artificial length fluctuation in the output of the interferometer. So to avoid that, uh, we put all these things in uh, vacuum tubes. And this is a relatively um, high level of vacuum that we, we would find on Earth. So this, this is a uh, picture of the inside of the, the central station where we have the laser and the beam splitter. And you can see the various tubes are like uh, going through in, in from this building. Um, so through, the, through this tube, we actually send laser from this um, corner station to the end station. So this is the, the beam tube during the construction. So we have this beam tube that going from one end to the other end. And to protect the beam tube, uh, we actually also put a, a concrete slab on top of it uh, to safeguard the beam tube. This is because there is a high vacuum inside. If there is any leak happens or if any, anything happens here, uh, it's very hard to like produce the vacuum again because for, for initially it took almost like uh, one year to produce vacuum in this tube. So we don't want to go through the same process again. So this is an, uh, another picture of uh, the inframeter after um, like we, we already looked at this laser, um, active as isolations and also this uh, test mass, the mirror coatings. And here also there is another picture that's showing inside of this few uh, vacuum uh, chambers where the mirrors are kept. Um, apart from these big main mirrors, there are also many, many small mirrors that redirect the laser from one place to the other. And they are also kept inside the vacuum chambers and people are working on uh, those systems. So here, one more thing you would see in this picture is that we start with like around one or few watt lasers and it is amplified inside the laser system around like 125 watts and it goes inside this uh, uh, power recycling cavity. The power recycling cavity enhances from 125 watts to 5.7 kilowatts. And when it then, then again, it goes to the battery power cavities, then they are amplified into 815 kilowatts. So this is this assuming that uh, the input power is 125 watt. Currently, as I said, we only use around 70 watts. So effectively, at this point, we have around like uh, 200 kilowatts in the arms. But our goal is to like reach this 125 or even go to 180 uh, input watt, so which will correspondingly increase the power in the arms, and also the sensitivity of the instrument. So since I said there are a lot of significant uh, controls. Uh, control to monitor and collect. So as, we, as I said, so this this uh, for making this interferometer uh, it's like a one one per work or one field of study. It requires like expertise in many different fields uh, with optics uh, and uh, which can produce like a low. Uh, loss uh, coatings and uh, very polished mirrors and also like um, coatings and mechanics where you can have a very very good suspension system with a, a low level of um, noise then you can you, you also need to have uh, controls like uh, how to actuate the mirrors how to control the position of the mirrors then electronics where you get the signal from these uh, sensors and you want to do, uh, you want to like filter out noises from those uh, signals and only look at the signals, only look at the frequencies that are of interest. So you need to do some kind of filtering. And um, there are also like systems where you actually want to control the frequency of the laser, amplitude of the laser. So these active controls on those objects. So th this is basically amalg amalgamation of like many different fields that require uh, uh, for, for us to uh, operate and build this uh, instrument. So this is the, the final product of uh, all this uh, in, um, all this effort. And uh, on, the, on the left side, you see how LIGO Hanford and the right side LIGO Livingston. And you can see these are like really beautiful uh, large scale instrument that we've been able to build uh, with after, after a lot of work. This took probably around like two 
two to three decades of work from many different people on, on many different aspects of uh, this instrument. So uh, at this point, to this point, I just talked about like um, how the, what is the instrument uh, point from the instrument point of view. What are the things that need at least few of the things that need to be done to make this instrument work. But uh, not that is only not that's just not sufficient. We also need to work on the data analysis aspect where say, since instrument is like producing a large amount of data, so we should have to like go through those data and try to identify extract identify and extract gravitational signals. For that, we actually have to understand what is the signal that we are looking at. So we need a good gravitational signal model, and we are, should also be able to like distinguish between this gravitational signal and the nice artifact. There are a lot of things that happens around the instrument could also mimic this gravitational signal. So we should be able to identify and differentiate between an actual gravitational signal and the nice artifacts. And also we need an efficient and fast way of doing this because we cannot like sit around and do this for like many years. We need a fast output. So this requires like a development and implementation of like a very sophisticated both search algorithm and also like a signal models and which requires like a significant computational power. Um, so this is also an important point of like uh, making this detection possible. So this is uh, my conclusion slide. So it took nearly like a century of developments in almost all fields of science, like optics, uh, mechanics, uh, and electronics, and the computational field, uh, to actually build a detector that that we are able, that we are able to use to detect the gravitational signal. So even though in like 1960, Einstein proposed the existence of gravitational signal, at the time none of these technologies is available. So it's, it, may, it may be that um, we are at the right time to are able to build an instrument to able to detect these gravitational signals. So before that, it would not be possible because we would not have, have these this, uh, powerful computers or these powerful technologies to build all these um, high precision optics and uh, our very high power laser with uh, such a stability. So as I said, it's also required like a very innovative and uh, inventive ideas from um, and, and many different fields. Uh, from people are actually working in this uh, particular gravitational research. As, as uh, with this uh, new, uh, up, after applying all these technologies, the LIGO and Virgo detectors were able to see many uh, binary black holes and uh, binary neutron star signals in the last, uh, the past three observing runs. And uh, I think uh, we are now entering in a new era of uh, astronomy where we can use gravitational signals to study these. Uh, um, black holes and binary neutrons are that are like distributed in far distance in the in the universe, and we would be able to understand not only their 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 evolution but also um, the the evolution of the universe as a whole. Thank you. I think that's that's all I want to be covered in this uh, talk. हाँ हाँ अरे काय सर आंसर आवाज़ इतना ही यानी सर गेले ही करनो सर नहीं पर आहेत but share screen off नहीं या this definitely was an informative talk uh, even though few there were glitches in the middle, but of course uh, it was very informative. The there's one question on YouTube which I would like to ask. It is by Parth uh, Tulsapurkar. He's asking, how do you calibrate the sensors? Do you use filters or feedback mechanisms? Um, so the calibration happens at many different levels. Uh, so we do calibrate like individual parts, like individual um, uh, sensors, and we also calibrate the whole instrument, instrument as a whole. Uh, these things generally uh, we have we basically use like a standard uh, um, instrument that's available in the from from the market, uh, like SR 780. Uh, this instrument basically looks at the signals coming from these photo detectors and can calibrate those signals. So we basically use them. 
Okay. Uh, I guess Zameer sir uh, in the Zoom meeting uh, he has a few questions. Uh, sir Zameer sir, you may ask. Uh, hi Shivraj. So I have few questions on behalf of some students and from me. Okay. So uh, like, why do we need uh, such a huge power laser? So uh, we amplify it goes up to two hundred watt, right? So yeah. So can you tell a little so, bit about lasers and so all? So the density of the instrument is directly proportional to the amount of power that you are putting in. Um, so if you are putting in 25 watts, then you would the sensitivity will be like a little bit low. So you can't see further in the in the universe, or so you can see, you can't see many gravitational wave signals. So if you want to see further in the universe and also to see many gravitational signals, we have to pump up the power. Um, there are many, as I said, you can have like different configuration to enhance the power. But the other the other thing you can do is you can also actually put more power in, in from the input, uh, so that you can uh, you can have much more enhancement. So that's why we are going to up to like a 200 watts laser. That's what we wanted to go. So at this point, we are around like 70 watts. Okay, but when uh, LIGO India will come, so uh, like, does it have potential to reach up to 200 watt? So the, the so that that depends on the laser technology development. So that's one of the problem that we are not able to we, we were not able to go to this uh, 200 watts at this point. Uh, there are some glitches in like producing a stable laser at that power. So this this comes from this is basically like comes from how how much industry can support us and how much uh, we can do development ourselves. Uh, so this is a combination of those two. And if that works out, then I mean, LIGO of India also will also have uh, some 200 watt laser. So this will be common for both um, detectors in the US and in the, and in the LIGO of India. So it has to be developed like together. Okay, so, and uh, the second question is like, how are you reducing your signal to noise ratio? Because you have a huge power and I don't know like oh, what kind of noise uh, will be there. Like uh, may, it may be coupling from one system to another system. So how are you reducing the noises? Yeah, so that one of the, one of the uh, complicated thing that we have to do is like uh, control of these different parts of the mirrors. Since there is a single laser that's going from one part to the other, there is always some kind of coupling. Um, but we do look at the signal from these different uh, sensors and we try to do some kind of diagonalization so that uh, that we will be only looking at the uh, effect of this signal in one particular mirror. Um, so that, that that's how we define did we devise these control signals, control um, system to uh, control this mirror so that uh, the effect of one part is not uh, significantly affecting the operation of the another part. So that is part of the control design system design. Okay, uh, and uh, you're reaching to the quantum level, right, in optics, so to reduce the noise, if I'm not wrong. Yes, so uh, I think uh, the, the, the detector itself. The, yeah, the noise curve that I showed in the picture, uh, is mostly dominated by the quantum noise. Uh, at the high frequencies, uh, it is dominated by the short noise, which is basically like a quantum nature of the particle, the quantum nature of the photon that is affecting how much uh, signal that we can see. At, at low frequencies, it is uh, affected by, again, the, the quantum nature of the light, like it is like bouncing back and forth on the mirror. So it's affecting the motion of the mirror. So this is basically the dominant noise source uh, in the inter our interferometer. Um, so we do, we are basically at the quantum level, uh, we are limited by the quantum noises at, at most of the frequencies in our environment. Okay, what do you think, what are the major challenges what we are like, uh, the LIGO India is going to face? So one question is uh, from student. So, and how we are going to tackle and how students can contribute in this. So that is one question. So LIGO India, we, we are in a good position in the sense uh, we are we are not building something from scratch. So we are going to probably leverage on the experience gained by by the people who build the instrument in the U.S. But we will also have uh, some of the things that we need to develop our our own, like this um, building these tubes and maintaining this vacuum. All those things has to be done by us. Uh, so we are. I think one other thing that we probably will be looking at at this point is like finding industries 
that can come and do this kind of large scale uh, academic work. Um, at this point, most of the most of the industrial works are for like uh, for pub common public. Uh, so this this kind of large scale projects, um, I think they need to take up, and that's probably uh, something that uh, we need to uh, think about in India. Um, I think that's probably will be the main thing. Uh, apart from that, um, I think from research point of view, I think we have enough people that working on uh, having expertise in different fields. Uh, we should be able to uh, move faster in that front. Regarding the the student research by students, um, I think we are trying to engage uh, students at different levels to uh, start work with the uh, LIGO India projects and our gender in general LIGO uh, related fields. So that uh, when the Live India comes up, they will be able to like actively contribute um, at the site and also outside the site in the data analysis. Set up some programs so that uh, uh, we can reach out to these um, undergraduate students and master students. Um, that is in, in in the progress. It will take a little bit time, uh, especially during this uh, COVID scenario. But I hope uh, we will have some something ready in, in next year. Uh, students are mainly focused like uh, toward instrumentation. There are a few students uh, in this club and who are really wanted to do some instrumentation in LIGO. So uh, can you guide them or can you tell them like what are the opportunities which are like from uh, in upcoming days? Yeah, so uh, I think that's one other thing that we are also focusing on. We already have a lot of people who are working on data analysis and uh, theoretical modeling. And for instrumentation, it's a little bit lacking. So we have we are trying to set up these uh, training facilities generally for focused on instrumentation aspects uh, where you can learn like in, in the simple uh, fabric operations uh, and uh, how thing how control signals are like applied and how they work and it's also working with the people there like get some hands on experience so one more question so how you overcoming this short noise because uh, it, it's completely associated with the uh the detectors and uh, how have you worked on it so may i know uh short noise so it, as i said this is one of the limiting noise in in our instrument uh what you can easily uh, overcome this by either increasing the laser power so this here comes from the grainy nature of the part of the light and if you have more light that means uh, the fluctuation that you would see will be reduced the number of uh, photon fl fluctuation in the number of photons produced, it use a large amount of power. And that's one of the reason also we are planning to go with like high power laser, like going from 70 watts to 200 watts that will reduce the sharp noise. And also like this, now we have these new technologies called squeezing, uh, where we can uh, reduce this uh, sharp noise uh, by, uh, by, by making the light in a special state such that uh, you, you don't have, you are not affected by this grainy nature at least in the in the high frequency region okay so we we have two more questions so the uh, another question is uh, so regarding data analysis uh, are there any activity going on search for true event in our archive data of ligo as ligo was started in 2002 and first detection was in 2015 and with current optimized algorithm using from our previous data I, I, so the data is already public. So if people wants to do analyze, analyze the data, they are they are free to analyze. Uh, but our estimate uh, that uh, in the old data, the instrument is probably not that sensitive to see signals. So uh, we did many searches in, in that data also. We didn't find anything. Um, it's, it's it's possible that we with with like a sophisticated algorithms develop development that happened after. There might be one or two, there might be some signals, but it is, from my perspective, it's there could be potential unlikely. sources, right? Yeah, there could be potential sources. Uh, but as I said, the sensitivity of the instrument at the time was like a little bit lower. Uh, so uh, from our our that our models, we expect that we expect not to see uh, many events. So maybe one event that we're hiding somewhere, uh, but that requires significant of work. Okay, and uh, the ne next question from uh, Nishant Pawar is, uh, apart from LISA Cosmic Explorer, if gravitational detector is built on the moon, then how it will be beneficial? 
I don't think there is uh, any plan to build anything on moon. Uh, Lisa is just going to be flying around the sun. So, um, so we are going to have the, the space, space uh, based detectors will be sensitive at low frequency. So basically they will complement the ground based detectors which are um, sensitive at uh, relatively high frequencies. So the space-based detectors can go up to like um, millihertz uh, below, uh, but LIGO detectors can are sensitive at like a kilohertz region. So they, they can complement each other. Um, that's, what, that's what we are hoping to achieve. Uh, we are hoping to happen uh, in, the, in the future when the LISA flies. But I don't think it's a plan for building any uh, detectors on either on one or other other planets. So what is holding us to go on a higher frequency? Is it the detectors technology or what? Higher frequencies, it's basically short noise limiter. So you need to increase the, as you see this noise curve, the short noise keeps going up. Uh, so, so you have to increase the laser uh, power to, to reduce the short noise. And also technical problems is there because uh, you have this, um, Signal processing has to be done fast. So higher frequency means all the analysis has to be done fast and the control signal has to be done. And you will also have to, uh, in higher frequency, we will also have a lot of uh, uh, like pickups, RR signal pickups and all those things happen. So higher frequency is generally noisy in terms of electronics. So that also have to be like avoided. That means we need to produce a very low noise electronics um, also to deal with this high frequency analysis. So both in terms of instrumentation, like we need to go high power and also from electronic side also, we need to have like a better electronics. Okay, so those are the questions from my side. So if there are still some questions on YouTube, so, so I will ask Rumbai. So Rumbai, is there any questions on YouTube still? Vedam? We don't have more questions on YouTube. Okay. So I guess uh, we, we are done and uh, we are really thankful to Shivraj and thanks Shivraj for like uh, spending some time for us. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm so, happy to have to this, but I'm also sorry that there was some lot of couple of interruption in, in between, which I was not expecting. Uh, but uh, thanks for organizing this. I think it's actually a good uh, way to like reach out to students, uh, at least especially in this uh, current scenario, uh, so that we can share what's happening uh, in the our, uh, in the academic scenario, uh, so that we can actually get their help at some point. Thank you.